Okay. The next question is, you mentioned asking your patients about their family history and how important that is. I know we got into that about how important it is, how much you can learn from getting a family history. And this person asked, what questions or information do you ask new patients on family history? Oh, I'm glad somebody asked that question because it's something I feel so strongly about. A lot of times patients will come in and they'll say, I have my 23andMe data. Is that all you need? And I was like, actually, that pretty much tells me nothing. We'll take it. Thank you very much. And we will scour the hell out of it. And we'll find out if you have a Tom 40 SNP and that'll increase your risk of Alzheimer's disease. And maybe you got a certain FOXO3 SNP and there's some interesting stuff here and there. Obviously, the genes that we think really matter, we're measuring on our own, such as the MTHFR genes and, of course, the APOE. But what I say to them is, look, this stuff doesn't mean jack compared to your family history. Once in a while, you'll see a patient who's been adopted or has been estranged from some part of their family for which that's simply impossible to know, and that is what it is. But for somebody who's not in that situation, we actually give our patients a template to be filled out in advance of our first meeting. And the template goes through the following. So for mother, father, both sets of grandparents, and all aunts and uncles and siblings, we actually want to know everything that is knowable. So our template is really painful for the patients. I will acknowledge that up front. So starting with cardiovascular disease, does anybody have a history of cardiovascular disease? Did they take any medication for blood pressure, cholesterol? Did they ever have a stroke, chest pain, heart attack, all of these kinds of things? We go through the same type of questions around dementia and then cancer and then metabolic disease. Did they have diabetes? And then when we're talking about this, because the reality of it is virtually nobody can show up with that level of granularity. So then these become the questions we prod. And I think it's important to give patients that information long before you see them. Nobody can show up to a first meeting with their doc and know that. You'd have to be a freak of nature to have that information at hand. And it usually requires lots of phone calls. And sometimes you're asking about relatives that have been long dead and or for whom you've never met. So the more you know these things, the better. And it's also important to understand context. You'll get some family histories that are full of cancer, but then you ask that second order question and find out, oh, well, that person also smoked three packs a day. If you didn't know that detail, you might be inclined to think, well, this person's family history of cancer is crazy. But in reality, every one of the people who died of cancer was also a three pack a day smoker. So you have to take that with a grain of salt. Similarly, the person who has a family member that died of a heart attack at 50, well, it's really important to know a lot about that person. Is this a case of LP little a, which can easily present in myocardial death at 50? Or was this somebody who was an alcoholic and or a very heavy smoker and or had some other risk factor? So I don't have a simple formula or template from this other than the more time you spend on it, the richer it is and the more you can potentially glean about what's really at the root of the genetic template that your patients inherited. It may sound silly, but it's almost like doing a book report when you're young and you're doing it on your dad or somebody like that and then just extending it out and then you may learn some things that are really surprising. Like you're talking about your dad's brother died of a heart attack at age 50. And then you found out they have more siblings and they had cardiovascular disease. And it seems a little bit younger and realize like if you haven't looked at it before that can start to connect some dots there, just looking at family history rather than looking at labs. I think it's a really important thing. I didn't even do my own until somewhat recently in the level of detail that I would expect of a patient. And that was kind of humbling. First, to realize, A, I hadn't done it, but two, to actually learn the information about the true mortality of all the aunts and uncles. And even now, by the way, I can't really provide a single shred of insight about how my paternal grandparents died, because they died before my dad was even married. My dad is potentially the world's single worst historian. So asking him anything about how his mom and dad died, I might as well use a Ouija board. He just keeps rambling off things that make absolutely no sense. So I can absolutely relate to my patients who come in and complain of the same thing, which is I asked my dad how his parents died or asked my mom how her parents died. And they just said they make up something that sounds completely nonsensical. So I truly have no clue how his parents died. And and frankly, I probably have no clue about a bunch of things in my family history. So it's tough. And 
but you do the best you can. And, and that information usually pays off quite a bit. And you're looking for patterns. This is where a lot of the times you'll see that signature of cancer. You'll see that signature of dementia, cardiovascular disease. And it also really helps with understanding what to make of the findings you have in front of you. One in 10 people roughly show up with an elevated LP little a, but the number by itself doesn't tell you how bad of a problem it is. I mean, we know LP little a is bad, but is this a big problem or just a medium problem? But the family history can often elucidate that. And the people who have a lot of sub 60 year old cardiovascular events and elevated LP little a, boy, like you need to be acting on that in the most aggressive manner. And then in the families where the LP little a is very elevated, but nobody's having any events into their 80s, maybe you don't need to be as aggressive. Thank you for listening to today's sneak peek AMA episode of The Drive. If you're interested in hearing the complete version of this AMA, you'll want to become a member. We created the membership program to bring you more in-depth exclusive content without relying on paid ads. Membership benefits are many, and beyond the complete episodes of the AMA each month, they include the following ridiculously comprehensive podcast show notes that detail every topic, paper, person, and thing we discuss on each episode of The Drive. Access to our private podcast feed. The Qualies, which are a super short podcast, typically less than five minutes, released every Tuesday through Friday, which highlight the best questions, topics, and tactics discussed on previous episodes of The Drive. This is particularly important for those of you who haven't heard all of the back episodes. It becomes a great way to go back and filter and decide which ones you want to listen to in detail. Really steep discount codes for products I use and believe in, but for which I don't get paid to endorse and benefits that we continue to add over time. If you want to learn more and access these member-only benefits, head over to peteratiamd.com forward slash subscribe. Lastly, if you're already a member, but you're hearing this, it means you haven't downloaded our member-only podcast feed where you can get the full access to the AMA and you don't have to listen to this. You can download that at peteratiamd.com forward slash members. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, all with the ID Peter Atia MD. You can also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast player you listen on. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about, where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies. Mm-hmm.